Um, this uh, workshop really has a couple of movements. First, I'm going to talk about mental health in general and why we need more training and education. I'm going to talk about some of the barriers. And then Mary, Dr. Bartlett, is going to briefly talk about postvention and what that looks and sounds like. We then go into the postvention intelligence um, and framework. And then from there, we're going to actually then go into a live scenario. You'll see an avatar appear up here. It's the person in the scenario that we'll describe to you. And Joe's been kind enough to volunteer to be in the hot seat. We'll run through that first scenario. Then we'll unpack the scenario as a group. And then we'll do a Q&A. And I think that'll probably take us to our time boundary. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, of note, Steve Davis, uh, one of the, the members of the research team, is actually at San Antonio doing work with the Air Education Training Command, so he couldn't be here. He's with us in spirit. Next slide, please. And that's what I talked about earlier, so you already know the way ahead. Next slide. The next series of slides just kind of lay the foundation around mental health. So um, the barriers um, to mental health are like people believe something needs to be done, but yet they feel isolated from others, especially may not talk about mental health. And then there's also a need for family. So some, sometimes family is not supporting. The solutions are really uh, one of the key solutions are better education. Next slide. Two out of three from the uh, research that was done by suicidepreventionnow.org, two out of three believe that there's not enough knowledge out there how to deal with mental health, particularly post-fention, post-suicide or suicide ideation. And, but eight out of 10 believe that they're open to learning how to do more. So the good news is people are wanting more information and they're willing to do what, what needs to be done. Next slide. 78% of the folks who are in the uh, respondents feel that more training and education primarily, and then second, greater access to care would help reduce suicides, both completions and ideations. Next slide, please. And Mary, if you're on Teams, I'd like to hand it over to you to talk about postvention on the next two slides. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Hank. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my two slides are going to sort of put the, lay the groundwork for what postvention is. What we know is that this is not a new term. This is a term that was coined in the early 1960s by Ed Schneidman, the founder of the American Association of Suicidology, to explain all the things, the activities that community leaders or leaders in the military, leaders of any organization or family unit, what, what have you, will do to help rebuild that organization or that unit after a suicide attempt is completed or a death by suicide. So it encompasses both aspects, after an attempt and after a completion. Um, we know that uh, leaders serve as the role model, and we know that postvention actually is good prevention. And just to lay, just sort of set the context, we know that uh, research shows that for every death by suicide, about 147 people are impacted by that. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen more than 147 people at the funeral of a service member. Um, so I think that it's far more than 147, but that's what we have. We know that 50% of the American population are going to ha have an, an experience of losing someone to suicide at some point in their life. And we know that there are over at present between 1993 and 2019, which are our newest stats, more than 5.4 million survivors of the suicide. Beyond all that, we know that when you experience a suicide, when you lose a loved one or a close family member or a friend, you are at a higher risk to die by suicide. Um, the other value of suicide, of the postvention, if you go to the next slide, is what are the actual goals? A lot of people think that the after, in the aftermath of a suicide, it's sort of, you know, do what makes you feel good, do what makes you think makes people be, do, uh, feel good. But in fact, there are strategic goals to this process. And when we know that when military leaders follow these things and aspire to these three things, they potentially reduce the likelihood of experiencing another suicide in their community, and they can move on to do other strategic things that will strengthen, uh, make the community more robust and resilient. And so the three target goals in the in the uh, work of effective postvention and efficacious postvention is to promote healthy healing, reduce the risk of contagion, which is other people dying by suicide, 
and linking people who might be at risk to the resources that they need to get the help so that they may move away from their own thoughts of suicide. Postvention messaging is crucial because what happens in the wake of a suicide is another person who might be a vulner in the vulnerable population might then generate the idea and think, mm, I think I want to end my pain too. That's what contagion is. Those are the, that's the definition and those are the three goals. And that's sort of what led us here to today. Dr. Hank, over to you. Thank you, Mary. Um, before we go to the next slide, I just want to point out Dr. Mary Bartlett's been around mental health and suicide prevention and postvention for a number of years. She's a leading suicidologist in SME for the air and space forces. In fact, now she's being called upon by the Navy to do some work up north. So, Mary, we're just blessed and very fortunate to have you among our midst, and thank you for being our team. Next slide, please. Um, a couple bullets up there. I'm just going to focus on a few of them. The first one, um, the importance of a new postvention intelligence framework or PI framework. Think of EI, emotional intelligence. It had four different quadrants. Two of them dealt with self, two of them dealt with um, others or social. Self-awareness, self-management, and then social awareness, relationship management. Our intelligence framework's a little bit more holistic and robust than that. But what it does, it provides a framework that looks at an individual leader and team and the organization to understand their PI score in relation to three levels of operation, self, team, and organization, and the three, three circles of influence what we call awareness, connection, and, or action to improve the PI score. It's pretty easy to use, and we're going to get that um, uh, to that uh, assessment momentarily. It also offers an empirical understanding of where to focus efforts on prevention and postvention, and from where the challenges have occurred in someone's life, the past, present, or future. And then last, it, it nests not only with our A, uh, Air University's quality enhancement program efforts, it also addresses the goals, objectives, and findings from several reports and strategies dating from uh, 2012 to, to just last year in 2022. Next slide. So the folks in the room that are uh, present here actually have this as a handout. We're gonna ask that, um, we're gonna stay on the site for a bit. If you're joining us via Teams, Please go ahead and take this assessment. It takes about three minutes to go through all 20 questions. And in about three to four minutes, I'll ask if you need more time, and then we'll go to the next sheet. Simena, just remember your scores on the different numbers. So as you're adding up your scores, you actually get a score for each of the components of self, team, organization, awareness, connection, and influence. Those 18 questions plus the answers uh, to one and two add up to some number out of 100. I'm not gonna ask anyone to share their score with us, that's for you. What we've seen so far in the, the folks that we've given it to, they score in somewhere between low 70 to high 80. We don't want you to think of this as a grade. We want you to think of a, out of 100, what can you do to maybe increase your score by one or two? So if there's a low area, for example, when I took it, I was kind of low in the team score and a little bit lower in the influence or action area. So that might mean for us as an instructor, I might say if a student had that, and I might ask Joe, I'm gonna imagine Joe, I'm just gonna, for the purpose of this exercise, you scored the lowest in team and, and action. Well, guess what? We have a, um, a couple scenarios that we can then provide to you based upon your score, because we want to get you in the hot seat and get you a rep in the area that maybe you're not that strongest in to raise that score. And then you would say, now, now how do you feel about that at the end? And what's one thing you could do to increase your score this time? So let's just say in the team level, um, those are questions nine through 14. I'm aware of my family, friends. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So under the team level, it's that middle band. I'm aware of my family, friends, challenges with mental health. I know the right language to talk about suicide postvention with others. I feel I can reach out or have reached out to others for help with my mental health or own wellness. Others have reached out to me and you can see. And so we would assess something in there and probably before we put you in the hot seat, what summer maybe you think you might be able to work on right now. And then we give you that opportunity. So if we had more time, we'd go through this. I just want to give a little bit of the rationale behind it. 
Um, the data sources that helped build this assessment and model or framework were pulled from three different data sources. A whole two years of data from our leader development course, so about 1,800 uh, or so student um, end of course evaluations. Also looked at uh, chaplain college training at different levels of um, levels of chaplains, including some some wing leaders or brigade leaders equivalent to the Army. And then we also took data collected after training Global Strike Command. Think it's a, a MATCHCOM, Major Command of the Air Force, think four-star level in, in the Army. Um, and so that data helped build this. So it's not perfect, but we think we've addressed all the right areas. We have a whole bunch of literature to help support that, not for this presentation, though. So with that, um, Joe, I'm going to, in a moment, have you coming up. We're going to do a tech check first. And then once we get done with this, um, in fact, tell you what, let, let's go to the next um, slide because I want to make sure everyone can see the scenario. So I'll read this out loud and then we'll come up and do the tech checks to make sure everything's going and then Joe will we'll invite you up. So scenario one, you are the new senior leader of a similar organization to which you currently belong. One of your relatively new and younger members is Alex Brown, a staff specialist slash personnelist. They've had some trouble adjusting to their new job. Over the past year, Alex has had several disciplinary issues regarding tardiness. They just completed a short stay in a local mental health facility due to a suicide attempt. The organization knows that this has happened. You, Joe in this case, have been called in, you've called Alex in to discuss the current situation, the potential steps to reintegrate them back into the organization after a hospital stay, or other options of what their future may look like. Joe, you good with that? Okay. Let's go ahead and, and switch to Zoom, please. Are you speaking to me? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Alex. I'm sorry. This is John Hink. I'm the um, secretary to the commander who's called you and would like to just talk to you about the reintegration. I just wanted to do a comms check to make sure you could hear me okay. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Um, stand by. I'll get the commander and he'll be in in about uh, 10 to 15 seconds, okay? Copy that, sir. Let's see that's in fact when you can see yourself there at this All right. Is the mic already on? Yes. Can I just uh, say hi to Alex? Is that how it works? Okay. Hi, Alex. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, sir. How about yourself? Doing doing well, doing well. Um, thanks for taking the time to see me today. Uh, so uh, trying to put this delicately, I know you, you've been through kind of a rough patch and uh, wanted to see kind of a way forward to make sure that you continue to be a valued member of the team while we uh, look after uh, your your personal needs as necessary. Okay. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your what's your personal background? Where are you from? What's your family? Oh, um, I'm from up north. I'm from New England. Um, I mean, regular family, I guess, like two working parents, and I have a couple siblings, two brothers. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm kind of like, a, I, I like the north, I like the northeast, I like cold weather, I like skiing, outdoor activities, things like that. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of just an average, ordinary girl, I guess. Okay, that's good. Um, and uh, how long have you been uh, w with our organization? Uh, just over two years. So okay. I, I like it a lot. The work okay. can be a little bit challenging just because there's a lot of moving parts to everything that I do, but I, I like that. Okay. Um, and uh, what are your plans for the immediate future with the organization? With the organization, I mean, I'm not necessarily sure. I'm still putting everything together since um, that current hospital stay that I, I had. Um, I'm just working on an outpatient program and trying to focus on just each day singularly at this point. I was putting a lot of pressure on myself for future career things and relationship things and just like life markers. And I think that that stress contributed to the situation I was in. Okay. 
that's um that's good information to have so have without getting into anything too personal and please let me know if i'm getting into an area i shouldn't be getting into are there any restrictions on what you can and can't do with the organization while you're going through your program um, no, that's a good question. I, I don't believe so. I mean, I know that I have to visit. I visit with my, I do kind of a post-op treatment um, four days a week. I am currently on an antidepressant, but they've told me that it's nothing that should interfere. It's tough for now. And it's, you know, low dose. It's just something to, you know, keep me kind of neutral while I integrate back into work and my lifestyle. Uh, I was told that none of this should technically interfere with my daily uh, job duties and responsibilities, uh, but they did want me to have conversations with folks like yourself so that in the event I am struggling with anything or in the event that you discover I might be struggling with something that we have a clear line of communication so that you could tell me or I could tell you. Uh, that, that's good. That's great. Great information to have. And obviously, you you know, your your well-being is is paramount to us. But I also want to make sure that you're able to continue to be a valuable member of the team and contribute in a way that uh, makes the organization and yourself thrive. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that there's no at least uh, uh, severe restrictions on your ability to help out with what we're doing here. Um, so I guess the next question I have is, how do you see yourself? Um, reintegrating with the team now that you're back from the hospital? Um, well, I know it's no mystery what I went through, and I, I'm actually probably happy that colleagues and peers know at least just, you know, the general reasoning why I've been out and what went on. Um, you know, I obviously don't want people talking about it necessarily, but I, I also don't want anyone walking on eggshells, so I'm not quite sure whose responsibility or who the best point person is to create that kind of welcoming environment. Like, it's okay to ask me questions about it, but, you know, maybe we don't need to make it a focal point or anything. I, I guess the easiest way for me to say it is, I, I, like I said, I, I want people to feel okay to ask me things if, if, if they want to know, but, you know, I mean, there's a right time and a right place and, Maybe just give me maybe at least a week or so of integrating back in. So if that's something that can gracefully be addressed before I like even, you know, really start back, which is next week, that would be really helpful, I, I believe. No, that, that's I appreciate you sharing that with us because that's important. I'll, I want to make sure that you're you're comfortable uh, with with uh, the situation and that we're not making bringing any undue uh, issues for either you or the organization going forward. Um, obviously. I would ask you let us know uh, either me directly or or one or you know our my my assistant if there's any discomfiture from anyone I'm talking to you about this or pressuring you or uh, obviously it is it is flash traffic to me if you feel like there are people talking about this in a way that you feel is inappropriate um, because I will not stand for that. Uh, I hope you understand that. I do understand that. I, I appreciate, appreciate you saying it though, sir. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't foresee anybody you know, having a difficult time with it, but I, it's just, um, it's important. My therapist said it's important that I at least am advocate for myself and I have faith in you and trust in you. So I, I, I will come to you should it ever become an issue, sir. Yeah. And I, I would hope that that would not be a problem here, but I wanted to make sure that was clear so that we're not, uh, not surprised down the road or you have any questions about the appropriate thing to say if something like that does happen. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So, uh, besides that, what, what, what do you, think you need from me right now as you reintegrate into the organization? Just so long as maybe a, a drafted email goes out just to let folks know that I'll be coming back and to keep it, you know, just, you know, I, I don't know, however you word it, I, I have, I trust. And then maybe just a bit of grace as I navigate my, my scheduling. Uh, I've tried to make all of my appointments um, so that they don't conflict with any work. Uh, but naturally, my, my self-care is pri priority right now. Um, so I'll try to come to you should any scheduling conflict arise with maybe, you know, I don't know, a, a medical appointment or follow up I need to do. Um, and I just, you know, the only thing I could ask is that maybe you'll just be understanding. I'm not asking 
for any special treatment and just, you know, some grace if should I have any anything come up, though I, I don't foresee it being a big issue. That's absolutely a reasonable request and we'll make sure we, we've worked that out there and all. What I'll do is I'll work email to make sure that we're covering the information without being too invasive for you. I'm going to say um, I appreciate that. And just let's give Joe a round of applause. We're going to ask um, if you're participating in Zoom, we're going to have you switch over to Teams and we'll continue the presentation there. Thank you. And when we can go back to the slide on the postvention intelligence framework, please. Let's go back two slides. Thank you. Great. So generally when we're done with something like this, we would say, Joe, how'd that feel for you? Uh, obviously a little awkward at first because of the nature of the interaction, but uh, I think that the, the structure that of that uh, inter that is that scenario is set up in a very natural way once you're going to get past the 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 AI uncanny valley-ishness of it. Um, but I, th I think it, it is it is the sort of situation a lot of leaders are going to encounter. Uh, and it covers a lot of the things you're looking at here as far as the, uh, the resources, the organizational piece of it as well as the individual. So I, I think it's a good cross-reference of the, the, the different levels and pieces involved in understanding a scenario like this. Yeah, yeah, bravo. Um, uh, great questions. You asked what and how questions. You actually gave voice and emphasis on what do you want us to do? How can we help you? What would you like? So in terms of having the right language and feeling that you can reach out to them, I mean, great, how will they be integrated? So you're hitting a lot of the stuff. And I would imagine if you went back to those areas and rescored, even if you're one point higher, we made a difference. We moved your score a little bit on that scale. And that's sort of what right feels like when we do these type of scenarios. Um, a little bit about, uh, yeah, question. Yeah, please. So if that was AI. Do you want to hit Yeah, so um, that that was pretty impressive. The the AI responding to the interface that that was it. Has this been done to scale within the Air Force? Is this has this been rolled out? And are there any um, what was the criterion for program effectiveness? Yeah, great. Um, so appreciate that question, Mike. Um, Mike's a former chair of the. I'm going to mess up the name. The department that that kind of runs this. Can you give me the right name? Command man. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, command leadership and management. Okay, thank you. Um, he's kind of the, the grandfather of putting this whole SLD forum together. So love that question. The answer is yes. Um, the Air Force has invested a lot in AI. Um, this, what you saw, is a company we have contracted with in leader development course and across Air University. And they, they're called Emotional Intelligence Institute. We have the CEO who will be able to answer some questions later. It's enough reality, enough of that it suspends disbelief. Whether you're in the hot seat or not, you begin to believe you're actually talking to someone and having an interaction. Because if I try to role play, Joe would have said, come on, I, you're not the person in. And so this allows you to lean in to that one. Um, we, we have asked their personnel to come to our faculty development so they understand what we do. Um, we give them a brief, we help develop the scenarios with them, and, they, and they've and they just been incredibly awesome in, in that whole. So the answer is yes, we actually have an ARVR expert that works in the uh, uh, Leadership and Innovation Institute at Air War College, but essentially he's being pulled all over Air University to do this type of training. Um, the biggest big venture right now is um, sexual awareness, sexual assault. So we're doing this as a part of that called live training, but essentially using the same technology. And because you get you get a rep, and it's it feels real when you're in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, I was half convinced there was someone on the other end, like responding to my questions, and the and the and the avatar was just sort of mimicking what what she was saying on the other side. Uh, it's yeah, very very good. 
simulation. Yeah, I will leave um, Janine uh, Klein, the CEO. She'll be online later. Um, or Janine, if you're there and you want to answer that question, if you want to share the magic um, behind the avatar, feel free to do that. Over. If you're on. Okay, Janine may not, may not be with us. Essentially, it's a live person who, who is connected to a device and it's immediate interaction. They can change voice module. They, even though the person may be a male, they can go to a female voice and vice versa. They have different backgrounds, different uniforms. So they really try to, to mimic. Sir. Okay, uh, my name is Bob O'Brien. I'm from the Army Talent Management Task Force. So what I think I just heard you say is that capability that we just saw was not an AI capability. It's a mimic of somebody who's on the other end speaking through an avatar. Is that right. what I just heard? We call that virtual augmented okay. uh, reality, virtual reality. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, we call that uh, ARV, augmented reality, virtual reality. So essentially it's, it's um, assisting AI because okay. there's a part of that that's allowing the person to, to do that. Okay. Is there a move afoot to go to a full AI model? I, I think that might be tough. Um, what we found in AI, and I just happened to go through MIT's machine learning course, so I know this. We're really good at, at, at getting AI to do problem solving in terms of facts and figures, not really good at the emotional stuff. Yeah. So that, that's kind of the, and there's more to it, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. I, Okay, yeah, tell you what, Janine, I'm going to move the mic to the Zoom, and if you want to talk, we might be able to hear you. Go ahead. Janine, go ahead. Janine, go ahead and talk. Um, I think you were unable to get on Teams, so, okay, we're back on uh, Zoom, so go ahead, Janine. And are we running that second scene? We are not going to run a second scene. We're doing a, a Q&A right now. Copy. Okay. And one question um, the audience had is, they're really interested to know a little bit of the magic um, behind this technology. Over. Great. Um, there's a lot of avatar systems that are out right now. now. I'm just going to try to put myself here. Um, we, we are using, are using right, right now one that was created for us by Roblox, Roblox technology, technology and some, some engineers from that, not uh, that have made uniforms. Uh, the technology is ever evolving, evolving. And, and the main, the main magic, magic behind the scene, the scene is, is, is the performer is trained, trained professionally, professionally. Uh, because, because tech tech as, as I said, technology, technology evolves and avatars, avatars evolve. But but in terms, in terms of how, how, how it works behind the scenes, scenes we use avatars, uh, avatars created, created by Roblox specifically for us. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Janine. Welcome, sir. Can you go back to, to Teams? Okay, um, okay I think we have a couple, a couple more minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, Other, Other questions out there, whether it's whether inside, it's inside or, uh, or uh, on Teams, sir? Teams, sir. So, John, my, my question has to deal with the training that the voices behind the avatars have, um, because clearly they have to be trained to provide the right kind of postvention uh, information. Yeah, yeah great. Um, yes. Janine? Yes, sir. Did you hear that question? I, I did not. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you say that again? Hi, Janine. My name is Maurice. Um, I was asking the, uh, about the actors that uh, support the avatars, the voices behind the avatars, and what level of training they have to provide appropriate postvention information, um, you know, to practice these reps. Um, for the people themselves, I, I hired professional actors and improvis during the pandemic when I started the company um, that were available because a lot of our work was furloughed. So. They are professional actors. They've been professional actors for 25, 30 years, most of my actors. Um, and when it comes to learning about the material, we work with each installation. Um, I, I kind of became obsessed with Air Force and, and 
got as much knowledge as I could get. And we do a 16, uh, we do a two week boot camp uh, for training. So they understand the vertical that they're working in. So it takes about two weeks to understand as much as we can with the acronyms and uh, locations and ranks. Um, and we probably do, we need to do the same for Army because this would be our first kind of move into that. We have some Iowa, um, excuse me, we have uh, Army National Guard that we're working with and doing some demonstrations with, but we're still creating that material so we can work with the installations to get the knowledge that we need to present the characters as truthfully and honestly as possible. My question actually dealt less with the uh, the culture that you're embedded in and more about the, the information regarding the appropriate postvention intervention. So oh, the, the psychological health and, and the responses that are that are being given by your actors over. We work with the postvention. We work with Dr. Bartlett on postvention uh, scenarios. Um, she gives us the correct language that can be used for that, um, since she is one of the top suicidologists, and she has been a great help to us with that. Um, we we do really kind of get the research from the experts and then incorporate that into the scenes. Um, we ourselves are more of uh, the the conversation, and we get as much information as we can and research as we can, but we really get that from the experts. Um, in order to utilize that in the scenes. Um, thank you for that answer. I think we know now that that answer, his, you can't see it, but uh, uh, Maurice's head is nodding. So, so. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so good acknowledgement there. And then I think we have a question uh, yep. from Tim. So, yep. go ahead. So, one, uh, the last question, since we're basically out of time here, it's uh, from uh, Colonel Rick Sheff, U.S. Air Force. Is the intent here to uh, more about making supervisors, leaders more comfortable? with members dealing with suicide or actually helping the airman, soldier? I think it's twofold. I think it's what we, that we do. There's a lot that are in leadership um, and there are in postvention. Everyone is, you know, and our team is certified in emotional intelligence, uh, Colonel. So um, basically we're trying to, we get, we try to learn as much as we can about about the, the that postvention um, piece, and I'm I'm getting lost because I can't see people. I'm so sorry. I'm such a visual person. No, hey, Jenny, no, that that's. I don't a great, know if I'm giving you the right answer. It is. That's a, that's a great start. Let me um let, let me just close that out, okay? Let me pile on to what you Thank just you. offered. Thank you. Um, so particularly for the leader development course, um, at the end of the uh, the eighth day, we actually run several capstone scenarios, and they range from discipline and justice to suicide, uh, postvention to mental health, and, and a couple other ones. And our students actually, it's a command team, it's an officer and an enlisted, sometimes it's an officer and a spouse, that actually sit in the two hot seats, and they get uh, they get faced with these scenarios. And it's a way to demonstrate a capstone level of integration in the human domain. So to answer the question from the, the respondent earlier, it's twofold. Yes, one, to gain their own knowledge, and then two, how do you respond? Because our course was developed, I'll make this really quick, in one or two sentences. A couple years ago, 2017, the Air Force did a study called the Squadron Vitality Report. It said as a, as a force, the leaders are technically competent but they're not great in the human domain. So someone brings me a messy human complex people problem, and we were failing as a force. So our course, the CSAP implemented this, it's a developmental gap, or a course to fill that developmental gap. So we get after it. To date, no one who's graduated from the course and been in command has ever been fired. So we're tracking those statistics as well. Um, and then, uh, sir, we had another question. Yeah, so you're doing this during the commander course down there, or what SOS, ACSE, what level of PME are you putting this it in? Is in? It's involved in, in SOS. It'll be involved in officer training school soon. It is in uh, the leader development course. Think pre-command course in two weeks, although they don't have to go through it in order to command. It's We try to get one to three years before command. It's being used in Air War College. It's definitely being used in the Air Command Staff College and their LP leadership and professionalism, and also in the leadership and command core courses. So this, this technology and integration using ARVR is being proliferated also in the chaplain school as well. Are you, are you doing anything at the Air War College at the, at the SDE level? With, with uh, we do in some of the electives. There is an um, ARVR task force 
that students from the global college, so online programs, ACS and Award College can take that and their big study, so it fulfills two electives, they write a paper that's expected to be presented at a um, ITSEC conference every year. So yes, sir. Yeah. I think we're at a time boundary. Um, Doug, I want to turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, hey, can you go to the last slide that has our contact info or the slide that has our contact info? That would you get, it's like two or three more slides. And also, just to add on to that, um, we also work with Sark Sapper, and we're in about 49 to 50 bases right now um, with ALS, Sark Sapper, and uh, ideation, uh, death notification. Yeah, hey, thank you, Janine. If you want to contact thank you. you certainly can um, contact me at john.hank at au.af.edu, and I can get to the email, contact her. Thank you, Doug, over to you to close this Yeah, the let's, uh, let's give a hand for uh, Mary and John. And there were a few more questions that if you want to take a look at, yeah. you, you can just jump on Teams. Yeah. Um, can you bring Teams up so we can see the questions, sir? And then, hey, um, I mean, I'm going to the social, but it's not for another 30 minutes. So um, we have, I think, right, we have Dr. Bartlett, the leading suicidologist in the world, um, definitely for the Air and Space Forces, um, myself. And they're opening it. That's called a stall, by the way. I'm just stalling so they can get the chat up. So now we have the chat up. And if someone wants to come off mute and ask their question out loud, either Mary, I, or someone will answer that question for you. They can't, they can't actually... oh, they can't. oh, OK. So they can't talk. So yeah, tell you what, stand by. Again, officially we're over, so you don't have to be here. If I may intervene uh, while you're reading the question, John, um, I just want to remind everyone about the social this evening at the 1757 Club, that is the golf course, um, at 950 Jim Thorpe Lane, 1730, and that's 530 p.m. until about 2000 or 8, 8 p.m. There will be some heavy appetizers and uh, not an open bar, but a, a no-ho social bar and you can also order from the menu. So uh, love to see you over there. Anybody that can come, that's also for those of you that are in Teams land. Thank you very much, and thanks, John. Is there yes, a sir, shuttle bus? You. Is there a shuttle? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, no we, we, we can close Zoom out. Um, hey, tell you what, um, Mary, since you're in Teams, can you capture those questions in chat? I'm just concerned about time, and so we might get one or two, but if you can copy and paste those, we can, and if folks can put their email in chat, then we can respond back to these questions as well. Okay. Great. Great, so I'm gonna scroll back up. Okay, so so this is from Richard. <laughs> okay, so he asked that already, yeah. Um, to Charles Allen. Okay, did you ask this? Are there progressive scripts? Um, yeah, we're not there yet. Um, it, and part of the reason is in our course, we have captains, majors, lieutenant colonels, um, E6 to E, I'm sorry, E7 to E9, a range of experience of spouses, we call them key spouses in uh, the Air Force, and then civilians of different ranks. So we have a generic scenario that's preparing them for squadron command. That's the one thing. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we work at length. It takes probably about 10 to 20 hours to develop the scenario that's general enough <laughs> but that hit some of our key learning points because it's tied back to our learning objectives, which we have for every seminar, or every piece of content that we teach. Right. So, but yeah, we'd love to do at graduated levels. Now, at the Chaplains College, they do have different training based upon the different level of chaplains that attend there. So, no, they have a different graduated level of some of the scenarios. Right. So. I would imagine here again, there's a progressive uh, improvement by the number of reps to get in the process of doing that. So again, 
you expect something different from a captain dealing with uh, problems in his in his his, uh, his company or something else, but for brigade commander, wing commander, or something else, <laughs> it's a different set of complexities he have to deal with. Absolutely. So our group and wing command um, uh, prep that might have a different expectation of that individual in the hot seat. Yes, right. I would imagine. So I don't. They're not using this in, in those, to my knowledge, but that would be. Yeah, I would imagine that. Right. Yeah. And so the other thing I'm, I guess I'm curious about and worry about is that is there an attempt to try to certify leaders in this type of response, this, this human side here, right? No. In fact, uh, no one's ever gotten 100 on, on the score yet. I don't think anyone would. That's probably unrealistic because we have some room to grow. So it's in, in one job you might feel now I'm in a new organization, that, that score might come down now because mm -hmm. you're brand new. So. You heard again about this commander's uh, command assessment program we have. So we have a bunch of things we're looking at, and we're trying to figure out what matters in the end towards the outcomes. So yeah. The same thing might be tied into this in organization. Uh, the softer skills, et cetera. So I'm, yeah. I'm wary that they might yeah. try to use something like this and tag you as certified or at risk in the process. So. Yeah, I think we, we expose folks to the very complex, messy thing called the human domain. Mm -hmm. And it's one to have knowledge, but it's two, how do you connect and be with someone in that moment? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like Joe did, how do you hold that tension of, hey, I want to make sure you can still v contribute to the mission as well. Right. That's a tension, because you can't say, are you ready to go to work? That's one extreme, mission focus. And the other one is, hey, I care all about you. And so how do you strike that balance? And it's going to depend upon the person in the context. That's what we try to teach. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, I'm looking at a couple new questions. Mary, was there maybe a question that you saw that you might be able to answer that you really resonate with that would require s someone of your depth or knowledge? Over. And Mary, you're yeah. muted. Oh. Oh, oh, they're going to turn the speaker back up, sorry. <laughs> okay, try now, Mary. Mary? We hear you. Okay, great. Um, I have first I've captured all the questions, so this is good. All the way to the contact information we tell the people. But the question you had that, that I'd like to respond to you said you asked does one resonate for me is um for the your kernel shift support for instance that's like it's such a delicate thing I would possibly move the supervisors into a policy and security that they are healthy therapy when you might actually be introducing a wild card into their therapy. I did respond to that in the chat. Sir, I wanted to make sure that people understand we are not in sabotage our training on um, experiential component or in any of our PD training on post-vention to years from, you know, um, all the way up to the and all the way up to office support. Asking us to get the therapists sort of yeah. service. Service members are discharged from the hospital. They are in a way of like to to Hey, Mary. Mary, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're having some feedback and it, it sounds garbled. I think it's a connection. Yeah. Um, so if you can type the answer in chat or type your email, and then what we'll do is we'll try to get those questions answered, maybe in a different format. Um, I just want to acknowledge the time. I want to thank everyone for being here. Doug, thank you for hosting. Um, thanks for the IT team. First time we've ever done Zoom through Teams, so love it. Thank you very much. We're going to sign off here. Appreciate everyone's support. Mary, I'll give you a call.